so kaushik it's 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 quite an interesting topic that we are uh, you know going to be discussing on today and the format that we'll be using for our audience is going to be more a conversational base where i'll be asking a few questions and kaushik will then be explaining uh, at the same time if you do have any additional questions please do put them down in the chat we'll then take them up at uh, by the time we come to the end of this discussion as well right so first of all as i mentioned it's a very interesting topic uh, gandhi and cricket uh, especially when it comes to uh, you know sports in in the country nobody's really considered gandhi to be as much you know closely associated with cricket but let's start off with his childhood and especially that he spent in rajkot now what were the sporting pursuits of gandhi like especially as someone who's just growing and was he really interested in modern sports namely cricket yeah uh, i mean uh, as you have just mentioned it's really uh, intriguing to find a kind of connection between gandhi and cricket because we have uh, heard very little about gandhi's connection with uh, entertainment activities like sport but uh, from his childhood uh, gandhi was actually a very playful character we we come to know from his own autobiography and his writings uh, hundreds of biographers of gandhi that uh, he was a little bit difficult and self will child uh, who probably insisted on having his way always uh, done but uh, according to one of his most reliable biographers parallel who was very close to gandhi as well he was a boy of uh, kind of very playful disposition uh, although very peaceful as well and was very simple in his habits and tastes and just to give you uh, a bit of what parallel thought of gandhi in his childhood uh, from his writings uh, he was a, an adept in hide and seek uh, and moy dandio a, a local game a, an indigenous game sometimes he used to take part in cricket and some other games uh, there were some physical culture appliances at home uh, occasionally he took exercise with these and went out for a drive in his father's horse carriage but not often his favorite exercise and recreation was were, were to remain long walks which were to remain from him uh, as the most significant physical exercise throughout his life now uh, gandhi was born in porbandar as he shifted to uh, rajkot uh, for his high school his aversion to sports became get gradually clearer uh, when he was in the 7th standard uh, i recollect uh, probably the parshi head master who was uh, uh, the um, who used to run the school uh, durab ji gimi uh, he made gymnastic and cricket compulsory for the students according to parallel gandhi disliked both firstly because he was very shy and shunned the company of other boys but secondly because he preferred to be uh, by his father's sick bed his father uh, was unwell for a long time and gandhi wanted to serve the cause of his father as gandhi himself wrote uh, I, i quote from gandhi i never took part in any exercise cricket or football before they were made compulsory my shyness was one of the reasons for this aloofness which i now see was wrong i then had the false notion that gymnastics had nothing to do with education but he admitted later that physical training should have as much place in the curriculum as mental training gandhi in fact learned from books uh, the benefits of long walks in open air and formed the for habit of talking, taking walks uh, which gave him a fairly hardy constitution but the real reason as i have already mentioned uh, for gandhi's dislike of sports was probably his keen desire to serve uh, his ailing father now there are such certain very interesting anecdotes about gandhi's childhood and his connection with sports louis fisher who is again one of the most celebrated western biographers of gandhi uh, wrote about gandhi's child gandhi's amusements as such that as a boy uh, he amused himself with rubber balloons and revolving tops he played tennis and cricket and also gilli danda uh, a game encountered in so many widely uh, separated countries Ramchandra Guo, the cricket historian, uh, has referred to uh, Louis Fisher's private papers, 
uh, in the New York Public Library where he found Fisher sending a list of questions uh, through an Indian friend to Gandhi's only surviving sister in December 1948. And uh, the sequel goes something like this. Uh, in answer to what does she remember about her brother Mohandas as a child and as a boy, uh, whether he played games or not, she replied that when Mahatmaji was young, he used to play with rubber balloons, tennis, cricket, and such other games. He used to have such great interest for those games that he would not remember even his meals. He would not stay at home in the evenings as he would get engrossed in the playing. So uh, there are certain anecdotes which relate to Gandhi's uh, pursuit of certain Western sports, but Gandhi himself always mentioned that he had a deep dislike for modern sports from the very beginning, from his childhood. Right. No, no, no. That's very interesting considering uh, one would not really, you know, think of probably Gandhi in a light of playing sports at any point in time. But this is a very different side that, you're, you know, you're trying to uh, uh, share with all of us about him being involved in sports, but probably not really having that mental satisfaction or that mental, uh, you know, bent of mind to really pursue it going ahead. And that really brings me to the next question about his formative years. One that really witnessed him uh, visiting countries uh, like England, like South Africa. And do we see any connections being drawn to cricket in these nations or even beyond? Uh, Gandhi had been in England and in South Africa, uh, say from the 1880s onwards for almost three and a half decades. Now, initially, when he was he arrived in England, one of his four notes of introduction was addressed to uh, Prince Ranjit Singh Ji, who, who was one of the famous Indian cricketers played in, playing for England uh, uh, during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, but interestingly, Gandhi probably uh, had not much connection with Ranji in terms of the game, in terms of cricket. Um, and uh, I, I, I remember one scholar, probably Ashish Nondi, um, talking about uh, both Ranji and Gandhi in such a way as that Ranji's appeal and defiance of the textbooks of cricket were not quite different from Gandhi's appeal and uh, Gandhi's defiance of the textbook of politics. So they went apart, but uh, in a way they were connected. But uh, to be honest, Gandhi uh, did not ever take any interest in cricket or sports, uh, at least in England. But when we try to find out his South African connection, uh, I think there are, again, several stories and anecdotes that connect Gandhi with, if not with cricket, with football. Uh, it, it is said that uh, Gandhi uh, encouraged football clubs in South Africa and many have, some of them, have argued that uh, Gandhi used football clubs as places to mobilize the Shottagrohis in South Africa. So uh, Gandhi's connection with uh, at least modern sport in South Africa uh, was something which he used for fighting against uh, the discrimination that was being waged by the British government against the Indians in South Africa. But again, we don't have much evidence about that. But uh, in a way, we can say that Gandhi's aversion to modern sporting courts continued unabated in South Africa, about which we have uh, uh, evidences from Gandhi's own writings. For example, in July 1910, the final match of the World Heavyweight Boxing Championship between uh, the white Jim Jeffries and the Negro uh, Jack Johnson uh, took place at Reno, United States of America, um, which attracted millions, including old, young, men and women, rich and poor, everybody, government officials, citizens, and everyone. Gandhi was in fact amazed to see people traveling all the way from Europe to view two men hitting, uh, as, he, as he mentioned, hitting each other and displaying their brute strength. He was surprised and he was so scathingly critical about this particular sports fad uh, in America. Uh, I, I, I uh, must quote here Gandhi, the people of America were, went mad over this show. And America is reckoned a very civilized country. What did the spectators gain from this show? We can offer no satisfactory answer to this question. There are some who hold that the body is strengthened through demonstrations of this kind and people learn how to defend themselves. 
a little reflection will show that this is altogether a mistaken notion. It is, of course, good to harden the body, but that cannot be done through boxing matches in public. There are many other means and natural ones of strengthening the body. This is no more than a pretext. The truth of the matter is that people enjoy seeing a fight and give their adoration of physical to physical strength only. They think nothing else can match it. In thinking this, thus, they deny the soul and therefore deny God. The only epithet that can be applied to such a people is barbarous. There is very little to learn from them. So you can understand that uh, Western sports even assumed the character of barbarism for Gandhi uh, while he was uh, fighting for the Indian cause in South Africa. And this particular aversion of Western sports continued uh, unabated when Gandhi came back to India. Uh, and in his initial years, say in the late 1910s and 20s, uh, this continued. I again just will refer to one very interesting incident that took place in the late 1920s early 1930s rather, uh, when Indian hockey team uh, clinched the first gold medal in the Olympics in 1928 and the expectations uh, for the Indian team to perform uh, very well in the next Olympics uh, began very high. And when the Olympics actually uh, was held in 1932, uh, Gandhi was a uh, kind of very, very, remained very, very indifferent to India's performance. In 1931, uh, when the civil disobedience campaign uh, when was, was going on, Gandhi was requested by the Indian Hockey Federation to subscribe to the Olympic Hockey Fund to support the preparations of the Olympic hockey team uh, for the ensuing Olympics. Gandhi, however, refused to be a party to it. In fact, he refused to actually uh, provide any fund to that uh, particular uh, initiative. So you can understand that uh, Gandhi was always, uh, barring probably a few exceptions where he made reference to Western sports, uh, was critical of Western sports, which was in line with his uh, basic idea of Western civilization, modern industrial societies, and his uh, dislike of entertainment and leisure, um, which he uh, propagated in his famous work, Hind Swaraj, in 1908. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Kaushik. It's, it's quite, quite interesting because I believe when I was reading through your book as well that he insisted that instead of really making your body go through such physical strains, especially through a fight, you would rather probably focus on something like agriculture where you have the farmer, you know, toiling very hardly, making his body go through so many things to, at the end of the day, for a, for a very just cause. So I think that was a very interesting uh, point of view that had been presented over there. Uh, it'll be keen to maybe even know at some point in time that what Gandhi may have thought about the recent uh, Olympics that just concluded and, you know, with so many medals coming in, but maybe for uh, another time. Uh, let's come back to talking about the early 1900s. Uh, they see a lot of growth when it comes to cricket, especially for Indians and on an international stage where you have an all Indian team with in 1911, uh, which was led by Maharaja Bhupinder Singh, uh, where at this point in time, where do you see his ideologies impacting the sport uh, during this period and probably even in the later years? Uh, uh, actually, uh, the, 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 the first few decades of the 20th century uh, was crucial in shaping uh, cricket as, a, as, a, uh, as an important sport in India. Cricket gradually was becoming a mass spectator sport. Uh, definitely, I will refer later to the Bombay Pentangular. But uh, in 1911, which was a very important year in the history of India, uh, when the capital was shifted to Delhi, uh, the, the, the Mohan Bagan team in Calcutta defeated the East Yorkshire to, for the first time, clinch the official tournament uh, in football. And also, this, is, this was the year when the first Indian cricket team visited England uh, to play against some very uh, balanced sides in England. Now, this particular in, this, this Indian team included uh, in its rank uh, one of the famous Indian cricketers, early Indian cricketers, uh, who came from a, a lower class, lower caste, uh, 
uh, vocation, uh, Palo Anchor Balu, and his career, along with the career of uh, his three other brothers, Shivram, Vithal, and Ganpat, coincided with Gandhi's fight against untouchability. In fact, Gandhi's anti colonial mass politics, uh, his unending fight against untouchability, and his lifelong struggle to restore communal amity um, affected Indian cricket on a serious note. Uh, I refer to Balu because Balu has been uh, studied by many uh, historians, many journalists, and so on. He is a very well known figure uh, during his time and even afterwards. Now, Balu had to face a lot of discrimination while playing for his Hindu Gymkhana club in Bombay, as well as playing for India. Uh, but he fought stubbornly, as did his brothers. And the, dis the, the kind of discrimination, racial, uh, I mean, caste discrimination uh, that was waged against these four brothers uh, could be overcome probably because uh, it was also the time when Gandhi was unequivocally uh, voicing his grievances, voicing his uh, uh, kind of protest, uh, mobilizing people uh, against untouchability. And probably in the 19, early 1920s, when uh, a Chamar cricketer, as I quote unquote, uh, uh, a locust cricketer, uh, Balu's brother, Vithal became the captain of the Hindu Jimkhana team and uh, won the coveted quadrangular tournament in 1923. Uh, it actually uh, provided ground for interpreting that victory as a victory of Gandhi's untouchables, as, as I call them, because uh, this was a time when cricket uh, gradually was moving first for the first time moving towards meritocracy that cricket should be played any sport should be played on the basis of merit so gandhi's fight against uh, caste discrimination untouchability his fight for social uh, equality uh, had a semblance with what was happening uh, on the cricket field particularly uh, with with regard to with reference to these palankar brothers and later on balu who was a hero of bhr ambedkar uh, one of the leaders of Indian uh, depressed classes. Uh, ultimately, Balu turned to become a politician. He became a Gandhian politician and he fought against, unfortunately, in the 1930s against Ambedkar. Uh, he, he, in fact, took part in the elections and his candidacy uh, in the election for the Indian National Congress was probably because uh, his fame that he earned for uh, playing as a, uh, as a cricketer. So, that, that's how Gandhian, I mean, Gandhian ideals, uh, caste discrimination, fight against caste discrimination, and uh, cricketing politics uh, mixed uh, in, a, in, a, in a particular socio political situation of the 1920s and 1930s. Thanks. Thanks for that, Kaushik. Kaushik, something very interesting I must tell you. Uh, just during our introduction, I was talking about our, a walk that I do here in Mumbai called the Old Prabhadevi Walk. And as a part of that walk, we actually cover a street which has the name of Palwankar Balu because the street is named after him. Uh, oh, that's yeah, that's where I basically tell his story. Uh, we still don't know as to whether where he lived on that street or not, but uh, that's, that's where I, in fact, talk about his story and, of course, his brothers as well. So... A very interesting part. Many people in Mumbai would probably not be aware about a street being named after him here. Uh, great. So that, you made a mention about uh, the pentangular and the quadrangular. And just to apprise of the audience as well, that uh, in the early decades of the 20th century, this was a period when uh, we witnessed the emergence of cricket being competed among communities. Now, most of you would have been aware that Parsis were probably one of the first who got into the cricketing space. But eventually, you would be having Hindus, Muslims and others join in as well. And accordingly, their individual gymkhanas, which you today see uh, you know, very close to Chopati, uh, is basically fostering a culture now for cricket among these communities and an official tournament, uh, which was a triangular, then becomes a quadrangular and finally called the Bombay Pentangular is what is taking place, uh, you know, through these early decades of the 1900s. Now, this basically is a very important event, especially for people in Bombay, but also outside. However, Gandhi had a particular view on this as well, Kaushik, and it will be great to hear about what he had to say about the Bombay Pentangular. Yeah, you, you have just uh, very briefly outlined 
what the pink and pentangular meant for bombay it was a, a very successful uh, and probably commercially successful cricket tournament in colonial india uh, in fact ranji trophy uh, never could compete with the pentangular uh, till 1946 uh, the problem around the pentangular began in the late 1920s after the establishment of the board of control for cricket in india uh, and we, we find that gradually a movement to stop the pentangular which was run on definitely community lines uh, with with five initially four teams at that point of time it was quadrangular the parshis the europeans the hindus and the muslims and later on the rest uh, were added to the tournament in 1937 but it, it, it has become more popular uh, in the name of pentangular. Uh, it definitely was run on community lines, but there were very rare occasions in, in its history to show that uh, this, this, commu this community rivalry uh, was translated into violence, hooliganism, or uh, I mean, uh, any kind of communal uh, riots. So uh, basically, cricket provided a kind of platform through pentangular or quadrangular cricket uh, where uh, despite having virulent rivalry between communities, uh, the, the, the kind of spirit of brotherhood, uh, communal harmony always uh, could be detected in, in the uh, events of every year. Now, 19, the 1930s constituted a very critical decade in the history of Indian society and polity, as you probably uh, all know, that uh, it started with the uh, civil disobedience movement, uh, which continued till 1934 when the pentangular had to be stopped for a while. And then the British uh, came up with the communal award in 1932. Uh, then um, Gandhi himself made a rival of him, himself uh, with, with, the, with uh, the Bengali Shubhash Chandra Bosch uh, defeating his protege Pattavi Sitaramaya in 1939 to capture the Congress presidency twice in a row. Uh, ultimately, who made an exit from the Congress later on uh, due to Gandhi's opposition. On the other hand, you have the emergence of uh, Jinnah as a, as a uh, kind of uh, leader in Muslim politics, leading the Muslim League, and ult which ultimately culminated in the Lahore Resolution of Pakistan proposal uh, in 1940. Meanwhile, the Second World War broke out on 1st September 1939. Now, it was in this, on the, in this backdrop that anti-pentangular movement gained in momentum. There were many who uh, supported the pentangular tournament. There were quite a few who opposed this tournament, particularly uh, on the pretext of its communal character. And uh, there were journalists, there were native princes, there were congressmen who opposed the tournament. But there was also a, a kind of commercial backdrop to this uh, particular opposition because uh, with the presence of the pentangular tournament, it was difficult for the BCCI to run the Ranji Trophy uh, successfully and make, making it commercially viable. So that was uh, definitely a major reason behind the pentangular movement. But apparently, it was a question of communal uh, amity that uh, was raised by the uh, protesters, that was raised by, raised by the opposers of the movement. Now, it was in this context when the Second World War broke out in 1940 that the members of the Hindu Jimkhana became perplexed as to what to do with the uh, tournament. They, they, some of them wanted to stop the tournament, some of them wanted to continue with it, and there were many who argued that even if the tournament continued, uh, the Hindu Jimkhana should not take part uh, in that particular tournament. So what they ultimately decided, the authority of the Hindu Jimkhana decided, was to see Gandhi's counsel, uh, which was very unusual uh, because Gandhi was far removed, Gandhi's world was far removed from uh, the world of cricket, to uh, ultimately seek his uh, counsel in, the, in this regard. Uh, it was in the, in, in the first week of December when uh, three, a three-member delegation of the Hindu Jimkhana uh, went to meet uh, Gandhi and sought his advice. Now, this was, I put it in a different way. Now, I, I think this was the only occasion when we can find Gandhi uh, coming very close to cricket uh, as a game, uh, as politics, as commerce, and so on. And once the ball was in, in the court of Gandhi, uh, the Mahatma had either to play it or duck it. Now, being, being an astute politician, the Mahatma decided to play the ball with a straight bat, 
and tried to produce what I call a politically correct straight drive. His verdict on the pentangular cricket, uh, which I think all of you should uh, know, um, deserves reproduction, at least in part. Now, I I'm quoting from uh, Gandhi's own writings. And numerous inquiries have been made as to my opinion on the proposed pentangular cricket match in Bombay, advertised to be played on the 14th of December. I have just been made aware of the movement to withdraw from the match. I understand as a mark of grief over the arrests and imprisonment of Shottagrohis, more especially the recent arrests of leaders. A deputation of three representatives of the Hindu Jimkhana have also just been consulting me as to what their attitude should be. I must confess ignorance of these matches and of the etiquette governing them. My opinion must therefore be taken as of a layman knowing nothing of such sports and special rules governing them. But I must confess my sympathies wholly with those who would like to see these matches stopped. I express their opinion, this opinion, not merely as a shuttagrohi, desirous of getting public support in some way or other for the movement. I must say at once that the present movement is wholly independent of such demonstrations or adventitious support. But I would discountenance such amusements at a time when the whole of the thinking world should be mourning over a war that is threatening the stable life of Europe and its civilization and which bids fair to overwhelm Asia. I would rather say that all of those who are blessed with intelligence and opportunity devoted both to the devising means of stopping what appears to be senseless slaughter. It is like an ill wind which blows nobody any good. And holding this view, I naturally welcome the movement for stopping the forthcoming match from the narrow standpoint I have mentioned above. So this was the first reason Gandhi cited for stopping the Tunam. Incidentally, I would like the people, public of Bombay to revise their sporting code and erase from it communal matches. I can understand matches between colleges and institutions, but I never understood reasons for having Hindu, Parshi, Muslim, and other communal elements. I should have thought that such unsportsmanlike divisions would be considered taboos in sporting language and sporting manners. Can we not have some field of life which cannot be touched by the communal spirit? I should like, therefore, those who have anything to do with this movement to stop the match, broaden the issue, and take the opportunity of considering it from the highest standpoint and decide once for all upon banishing communal tents from the sporting world and also deciding upon banishing these sports from our life whilst bloodbath is going on. So this statement was followed by another very small dictum, uh, Gandhi. Uh, when Gandhi was asked whether he wanted only Hindus to boycott the pentangular cricket matches, Gandhi replied in a telegram, all who hold my opinion must refrain uh, whether few or many. Now, this was Gandhi's uh, categorical support uh, for the protesters against the pentangular at a polit politically turbulent time affecting public life in India and the whole world. And in fact, this was in line with what Gandhi suggested in Him Swaraj more than three decades earlier. Uh, an Indian of real strength, uh, he argued, will understand that at the time of mourning, there can be no indulgence, there can be no entertainment. So his incidental comment on erasing communal code from cricket, alias sport, was a reflection of his uncompromising stand on the question of communal amity in India. Gandhi's political stroke thus amply reflected the politicization of sport as well. So uh, what Gandhi said uh, in, in his response uh, to the members of the Hindu Jim Khana was very categorical and it provided interpretations callow. In fact, there were several critiques and interpretations to which I will come later, but it is suffice to say that after Gandhi gave that verdict that uh, pentangular movement should be stopped or Hindu Jim Khana should not take a part in it, it was difficult for the members of Hindu Jim Khana to, to really take part in it, at least in 1940. And there was a motion in the in the uh, uh, emergency meeting of the Jim Khana where uh, Gandhi's uh, view was endorsed and 
probably the, the vote voting uh, went like this 280 in favor of Gandhi uh, and 243 against Gandhi. I mean, in favor of stopping the movement or taking part in the uh, tournament and uh, against it. So you can understand that Gandhi's verdict played a crucial role in uh, kind of motivating at least parts of uh, the public of uh, colonial Bombay at that point of time and the Hindu Gymkhana members uh, for uh, not taking part in the tournament uh, at that point of time. Yes, and I think uh, the subsequent uh, thing will be interesting to know is what happened after that. And especially most of the people attending today's talk are residents or have some connect to the metropolis of Bombay. And you would have heard uh, various conflicting views from both sides about uh, what is it that they thought uh, when it came uh, you know, to asking their opinion basis what Gandhi had said. So what were really the people of Bombay saying at that point in time? Uh, in fact, as I've just mentioned that uh, even in, in the uh, emergency meeting of the Hindu Jim Khana, you can see that the difference of votes was only around 40, 40 odd votes, 40, 43. So it was only to kind of show some respect for Gandhi's words that the Hindu Jim Khana remained abstained uh, itself from, from playing the, in the tournament. But otherwise, uh, I think the people of uh, the, or the, the public sentiment uh, around Bombay uh, was in favor of playing uh, in the tournament. And that becomes clear from uh, at least from my reading of the two leading newspapers in uh, Bombay, Bombay Chronicle and Bombay Sentinel. Uh, I could not uh, actually find anyone who could give me uh, some interesting thoughts or some interesting, uh, I mean, anecdotes about those days uh, still living. I probably missed because I, my stay in Bombay or Mumbai uh, was for 15 days or so. So I couldn't manage to have someone to talk about this, but from the newspaper reports, uh, it, it becomes clear that there was scathing criticism of Gandhi. Now, I, I try, I put it in a different way. Now, what could Gandhi have done otherwise uh, in, in, in playing this particular ball uh, that, that was offered from uh, the Hindu Jim Khana to him? Now, even from a perspective of political advisability, Gandhi was reluctant to appreciate the element of change of heart in cricket. Now, he always fervently advocated uh, the, this element of change of heart uh, throughout his life. That if you have, if you can uh, kind of um, create uh, a kind of emotion in the hearts of the people, which would change them from, uh, from their uh, worse self to better self, then you don't need anything else to do. Now, cricket had that potential. If he could have could appreciate the game's role in fostering communal amity in the years preceding 1940 through the pentangular, he would have taken the chance probably to encourage the show to go on to cultivate the already enriched field of social unity vis-a-vis -vis communal face of politics and point out if Hindus and Muslims could remain in peace and brotherhood on the cricket field despite virulent rivalry, why could they not be able to remain so in politics and society? keeping India united. So it's the other way around, which Gandhi did not try. However, in a tense socio-political situation, Gandhi went by his political instinct and deemed this kind of a, uh, an opportunity to be too risky a proposition, probably. Or maybe Gandhi's rigidity about the ideal of Shruttagraho, his aversion to modern codes of leisure, stood in the way of experimenting with cricket as a cultural tool to foster communal amity. Now, against this backdrop, uh, the, the, the responses of uh, the crowd, uh, in fact, uh, cricket-loving crowd, cricket-loving people of Bombay uh, become very, very intriguing because there were uh, fewer who supported Gandhi. There were much greater in number uh, from different uh, walks of life who criticized Gandhi. I, I just want to mention one very uh, interesting uh, criticism, which was offered by uh, Rasha Mehta. Uh, he, he, uh, wrote something like this, that some of the members of the Hindu Jim Khana selection committee had even to drag Mr. Gandhi, who had never played cricket. 
as for Mr. Gandhi saying that uh, there should be no cricket because of the morning of the war, I say it is sheer hypocrisy on his part. Mr. Gandhi is one is the one man who is teaching the people of this country not to assist the British in their greatest hour of need, merely because the British cannot satisfy his political demands. Clearly then, he has no right publicly to express his sympathy by suggesting cancellation of the very popular cricket matches, a part of the proceeds of which could be given to help swell the various war funds. So uh, this was a kind of response that, uh, uh, that was coming up, coming from the people of Bombay. And uh, to make matters worse, in the next year, when uh, again, the Hindu Jim Khana appealed to Gandhi for his opinion, sought his opinion. Gandhi said that uh, his opinion, he, he stood by his opinion, which he provided in 1940. But unfortunately, uh, in, in 1941, the Hindu Jim Khana could not uh, continue their earlier stand, and they uh, went on participating in the tournament. And, and the pentangular uh, became very, very popular uh, again in 1941 with the joining of the Hindu Jim Khana. So you can understand that uh, probably Gandhi's uh, position in Indian politics, uh, uh, coupled with uh, Gandhi's so-called politically correct uh, decision or politically correct um, opinion um, with regard to cricket and pentangular tournament uh, did not ultimately become successful. And Hindu Jim Khana ultimately participated in 1941. But unfortunately, it was in 1946, February, when the last rites of pentangular tournament uh, took place, because it was due to the ensuing Hindu-Muslim relations, riots, and communal vanguard that uh, made pentangular a victim, and it was discontinued. So ultimately, probably Gandhi's vindication uh, became uh, somewhat justified. But uh, during the period when Gandhi actually talked about cricket and pentangular, uh, it, it could not be taken up in the right earnest by the people uh, at large. Thanks. Thanks for that, Kaushik. What is a very interesting fact that I came across in the book is that an individual who is considered to be a legend when it comes to citizens of Bombay is AFS or known as Bobby Talyar Khan, yes, who was yes. a very popular uh, commentator. And it was interesting to know for a person who became so you know, well known because of his commentary, especially during the pentangular, he was one of those who actually supported Gandhi's decision, if I'm not wrong. So uh, that was that was a very interesting insight, which uh, you know we were able to uh, get from the book as well. All right. Yes. Now, yeah. Sorry. Just, 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 just one thought. I mean, uh, there were some journal, some journalists like uh, Taliyar Khan, commented great commentator. And two very prominent journalists, uh, J.C. Moitro and Deri Sarvadikari, uh, who also, uh, in fact, supported Gandhi and uh, kind of wanted to uh, stop the pentangular and promote some regional tournament, probably the Nanji Trophy. Right. Now, let's come to post the pentangular, post independence, and even post Gandhi. It's been close to 75 years since independence and almost 150 years since cricket was introduced to the masses. Where do you see Indian cricket status currently in context to India after Gandhi? Now, Gandhi's afterlife actually uh, in, the, in the last, uh, say, 75 years or so uh, has coincided with cricket's rise as probably India's number one sport and cricket becoming uh, one of the major global brands for India, India's soft power, um, India, a, a platform where Indian uh, nation asserts its uh, presence in the international map. Uh, through cricket, India has become an economic giant where he, it, it nearly controls the cricket economy of the world and so on. Now, the question is uh, how uh, cricket has grown uh, in consonance with uh, how Gandhi probably thought about it or how Gandhi thought about independent India. Now, as we all know, politics has never been India's unitary strength uh, since ancient times and independent India has proved uh, this historical truth again and again, uh, barring on occasions of India's wars against Pakistan or China for that matter. Uh, and India's 
I mean, the real strength of Indian unity can always be found in its society or probably in its culture. Because India is a very, uh, vast, I mean, diverse country, a country with diversity and uh, with, with so many classes, castes, colors, uh, religions, languages, ethnicities, regions, and so on. So the sources of unity had to be found somewhere, elsewhere rather, in independent India. And this sphere is inevitably uh, some of the cultural spheres, cultural domains in which cricket is arguably probably the strongest representative of this cultural domain in 21st century India. Now Gandhi would certainly uh, have been appealed by the material commerce, cricket spins off or, or the excessive pass passion it generates, but might also have been overwhelmed by the unity it evokes in the everyday life of the nation. In fact, to, to Gandhi's heartwarming, cricket is after all, uh, non-violent combat. And I, I actually uh, prefer here uh, floating a kind of conjectural history or rather what you call uh, speculative history here. If, if had Gandhi been alive and I come straight to uh, what is happening right now, uh, the most successful uh, regional tournament in India, IPL, which is international definitely in character. And sometimes I tend to, I, I'm tempted to call the pentangular uh, a predecessor of the IPL, although it was not uh, in a way international, but definitely non-Indians used to play in it. Uh, so commercially viable, successful it was. Now, had Gandhi been alive, uh, would he approve of the Indian Premier League, I mean IPL? Now the answer uh, is very easy to seek. That probably, no, definitely not. Now he would have surely disapproved of the crass materialism of the IPL. Big money, Bollywood, cheerleaders would certainly be agents of impunity for an avidly ascetic Gandhi, diluting or rather destroying the spirit of the game. And Gandhi would certainly probably disapprove strongly of the IPL decision in 2009 to ban Pakistani players and commentators from the tournament since 2009, after the alleged Pakistan-sponsored terrorist attack on Mumbai on 26 November 2008. As some elements from Pakistan come to India with cricket bats and balls, while others visit with AK-47 and bombs, Gandhi would have emphasized on the good intention of the former. But you know, this is my view, make no mistake about it. Uh, his brand of nonviolence would have encouraged the latter to multiply their action to disturb the tranquility of the Indian nation. But interestingly, the IPL provides the perfect platform for promoting international amity through nonviolent cricket. Uh, in, it, in the first edition of the IPL, the same violent Kolkatans who, who had made a villain of Pakistan's Shoaib Akhtar for his duplicious involvement in Sachin Tendulkar's run out uh, in an Indo-Pakistan Asia Test Championship match held at the Eden Gardens a few years back uh, in early 1999, so far as I remember, cheered for him when he played for the Calcutta and Kolkata Knight Riders at the same venue in 2008. It was an intriguing example of how hatred and aggression are overcome by love and passion for the game. Gandhi would have loved to see such transformation on the cricket field, a change of heart. In fact, Gandhi would have been deep stri in deep strife, given the choice of favoring or stopping the IPL, as I presume. It was a much better choice for Gandhi in 1940 to declare the Bombay Pentangular unwelcome. But in the 21st century, when hatred and violence have generated so much aggression and terrorism across the world, it would have been difficult for Gandhi to denounce the IPL straight away, simply because it provides an ideal space for transnational brotherhood, where not only cricketers of otherwise opposing nations rub shoulders for a common cause, but fans, commentators, and people of diverse nationalities come together to support the imagery of an Indian city or region like Kolkata, Delhi, Punjab, or Gujarat. Gandhi might have been overwhelmed by such an unifying spirit of cricket. And the last word, uh, Gandhi is arguably uh, the most globalized icon of India, as is cricket among Indian sports. Given Gandhi's distinctive life, religion, ideas, and actions, the Gandhian world is far removed from the world of Indian cricket, which has come to imply commerce, politics, religion, and life to more than a billion Indians, albeit in a completely different sense. In fact, the divine image of Gandhi has almost had a replication in the deification of Sachin Tendulkar as a cricketing god. So whatever be the connections between, the, uh, between Gandhi and uh, cricket during his lifetime or after, he might have been the happiest person on this planet to see cricket's becoming of a great unifier of hearts in independent India. 
irrespective of class, caste, religion, language, ethnicity, and so on, albeit with an Indian revolution, which has fundamentally transformed the world of cricket in the new century. So Gandhi and cricket thus remain globally two of India's most enduring images, phenomena, and legacies that bind the nation very, very strongly. And they are there to stay for years to come. Oh, very, very well said, uh, Kaushik, and an interesting point of view as well. So that's all that I had to ask with respect to the topic specifically, except one point, which was what really led you to choose this topic to write on as well? Uh, honestly speaking, I never planned to write a book on Gandhi and cricket, although uh, it, would, it would have figured uh, in one of my ongoing projects on, on, India, on, on the history of India-Pakistan cricket. And I, I was actually dealing with uh, uh, the, the colonial transition, the transition from colonial to post-colonial India uh, with regard to uh, the communal character of cricket, the, the delicate passage from community to communal. It was at that point of time in, in 2016, early, early, late 16, early 17, when uh, a proposal came to me from the Rupa publishers uh, to write a book on this particular, uh, I mean, theme. But one very interesting uh, incident, which I recall, that actually ignited, excited me to think about Gandhi's connections with sports in general, not only cricket, uh, that, that we, with, with that I should end today. Uh, it was in uh, sometime in 2016, uh, when Gandhi and cricket featured uh, in the Indian media for uh, very interesting reasons. Uh, it was with reference to one social science textbook described for class nine uh, in Tripura uh, that a cricketing Gandhi made headlines. Uh, written by uh, Kollan Chaudhuri, uh, the book featured no national leaders except Gandhi, uh, except for Gandhi. And even he was mentioned not for his contribution to India's freedom movement, but for his views on cricket. Now there was much political hula balu over the issue uh, uh, as the BJP and other non-left political parties condemned the left government of Tripura for deliberately doing away with the history of India's freedom struggle and its illustrious leaders from the courts of history. Uh, the attempt, of course, according to these uh, non-left parties to, was to brainwash students with communist ideas. The Tripura Board of Secondary Education and the government denied any pressure on the part of, of the communist think tanks in the process and defended the action by referring to the uh, NCRT guidelines as the basis for framing the new history syllabus. Now, what struck me in this entire debate was not so much the resentment about the omission of Gandhi as a freedom fighter in the book or syllabus, but the crass public indifference to and a kind of disapproval of Gandhi's cricket connection in colonial India. Now, this is but natural in a country where aspects of everyday culture uh, like sport have long been ignored in educational curricula and uh, academic research. Uh, in fact, Gandhi and cricket, as I have already mentioned, are two of India's biggest global emblems. So any kind of connection between uh, these two emblems, between Gandhi and cricket or Gandhi and sport, uh, should be made available to the common people, should be made available to the students right from the beginning so that they can think differently. They can, they can always try to relate uh, uh, their everyday life, their, their, their everyday their practices with uh, the greater ideas, with, with the uh, notions that have shaped independent India uh, through the personalities like Gandhi uh, and other, Rabindranath Tagore and so on. So, uh, so th this particular incident I recall with pleasure now because that was something that really excited me to think about it in a different way. Oh, quite, quite fascinating, Kaushik. And thank you so much for, for taking those questions up as well. Uh, we have a few that have come in from the audience, so I'll just read them out. Uh, the first is from Shrikanth, who's asking that, is it true that Gandhiji started three football clubs called the Passive Resisters? He saw a tweet today about this, and he wanted to know whether it was true or not. Actually, uh, the football clubs that Gandhi is, was said to have started in uh, South Africa are, again, not based on much reliable sources. Uh, we have come across Gandhi's uh, interest in football and football clubs in South Africa. I have mentioned that he actually tried to appropriate football clubs and uh, the game itself uh, as a kind of means to mobilize the Shrutta Grohis or so 
but i think uh, uh, this is not based on sufficient evidence all right the next question is from farooq he's asking what do you think would be gandhi's reactions to india winning all these events in the olympics especially by women would he have been happy or would he have sulked now again this draws me to the kind of speculation uh, i think again uh, the, the way i see gandhi's uh, vision of uh, a tournament like I ipl i think uh, he must have been happy given the way indian democracy indian politics uh, and indian society has evolved over the last 75 years uh, this is a domain where uh, indians can come together for the cause of a nation so and definitely uh, when when women excel women assert india's identity uh, and women become uh, more and more uh, signifiers of uh, uh, the kind of values that uh, gandhi or for that matter other stalwarts in indian thinking world have uh, provided with the posterity right uh, so the next question is from vasant he has two questions i'll first take up the first one uh he wanted to know what was the origin of the formation of the pentangular division based on religion the pentangular tournament actually had its origins in the annual presidency matches uh, that uh, started in the early 1890s uh, it was probably in 1892 when the first match uh, took place between the parshis and the europeans it continued for nearly 15 years Uh, when in 1906 the hindu jimkhana joined the in the fray uh, then came the muslim jimkhana in 1912 probably uh, it became quadrangular and in 1937 uh, the other uh, which was called the rest with with other uh, europeans and other from people from other communities took part in that particular team and then it became the pentangular tournament the next question from vasant is that cricket pre independence until some time after independence was perceived as a symbol of colonial imperialism and a game for the rajas and maharajas what was gandhi's view on this so Ga gandhi actually directly never talked about uh, any modern sports whatsoever uh, their status and whenever he talked about them he clearly stated that he was i mean these sports were completely greek to him so he didn't know anything about it whenever he made reference to hockey cricket or uh, any other sports but what is interesting to find is that gandhi uh, had a kind of uh, faith in the good things of western civilization at, i mean like like the british he had a faith in the british when he was in south africa and uh, when he fought for the indian interest in south africa Uh, he tried to negotiate with the british government in india also uh, until 1929 uh, again he had a faith in british ideals of life and probably uh, i mean uh, given the way he thought about british ideals british ways of life uh, gandhi would not have uh, kind of uh, abrogated the existence of this modern sports in independent india but it was probably jawaharlal nehru uh, rather than gandhi who was instrumental in uh, kind of promoting on the part of the indian government new indian government uh, to uh, promote these uh, games uh, as markers of uh, india's rising status as a new nation so we have uh, the last question from commander mohan narayan is asking would it be fair to equate the pentangular tournament to the apartheid movement in international cricket where the erstwhile south african team refused to play with the colored teams uh, uh, i i don't think that uh, this kind of uh, uh, i mean kind of equ i mean equating with pentang pentangular with with what you call uh, south african apartheid movement uh, is possible but you know pentangular provided uh, a kind of platform where uh, i mean these these kind of discriminations were somewhat done away with and the best indian players whatever their uh, i mean affiliations could take part in the pentangular through different community line uh, clubs so in a way uh, it provided a kind of uh, a booster to anti apartheid movement 
And uh, I mean, sans Gandhi, the pentangular movement definitely, uh, I mean, kind of uh, acted as an inspirator. Uh, although I don't know whether there was any kind of connection between uh, what was happening in South Africa at that point of time and uh, the if euphoria uh, uh, around the pentangular, which definitely uh, was an example of, uh, I, I mean, brotherhood among uh, different castes, different classes, different ethnic peoples of India. Right. Thanks for that, Kaushik. Uh, compliments, uh, no more questions, but compliments coming in. There's a comment from Juhi. She says, Mahatma Gandhi's restraints or caveat on expressing his views about sports is something a lot of us can learn from, especially when posting our vehement reactive views on a whole range of topics that we may Off there. It was just a comment by Juhi that I wanted to state that uh, she says that Mahatma Gandhi's restraints or caveat on expressing his views about sports is something a lot of us can learn from, especially when posting our vehement reactive views on a whole range of topics that we maybe know little about, if not absolutely nothing. Yeah, absolutely agree. I mean, we have a lot to learn from Gandhi, but, but the way Gandhi has been appropriated uh, in recent times. Is, is so unfortunate. Uh, while we should remember what Gandhi really tried to teach us or Gandhi left lessons for us that have been conveniently forgotten. And uh, Gandhi uh, is sometimes appropriated for what he did not really stand for. So, I mean, even simply speaking, his hints for us is something which can always inspire us. All right, on that note, I think uh, Kaushik, I'd like to Personally, thank you on behalf of all of us here for taking out the time for this uh, discussion, especially on a, a momentous day today being Gandhi Jayanti. So it was very appropriate for us to speak about this. And also at a period where just around 7.30 p.m. is when the IPL starts off. So people probably have that in their minds when they're watching the, the cricket match as well. So thank you so much, Kaushik, for uh, this, this very in in interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks. Thanks again, Kaushik. And for those of you who have joined us, I'd like to thank you for being a part of today's interaction. Just a reminder, we have many events that have been lined up, as I've already shared, uh, just prior to this talk starting. So please do sign up for that. Uh, as For those of you who are willing to step out for our physical walks, we have the Ban Ganga walk happening tomorrow at 4 p.m. And uh, we have our online uh, virtual talks that will keep happening uh, every Saturday evening as well. But for now, I'd like to thank you so much for your time. Have a very good evening. Wishing you all a very happy Gandhi Jayanti. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.